readings. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker. He comes to us from Ontario, Canada, way up there. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your story tonight, Lance, and um, just you got till the top of the hour. So let us have it. Come on. Thank you. Appreciate thank your you. Support. Recording in progress. Well, thank you. And you know, I like to I like to reference the big book, and it's interesting you said you know my story because normally I open to the title page, and it says the story of how many thousands men and women have recovered from alcoholism. And you're gonna to get to hear my story over the next little bit and you're probably wondering who I am. So my name is Lance Howard. I am a recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is April the 5th of 1992. I have a home group. It's called the Riverside Men's Group. We meet Thursday nights at Riverside United Church. Um, I have a sponsor and he knows he's my sponsor. He has a sponsor. I sponsor men who sponsor men who sponsor men. And in fact, I think in one of the branches of our lineage, I think we're, we're eight deep, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I'm active in my home group. I'm currently the treasurer of my home group. I'm active in carrying uh, the steps uh, to still suffering alcoholics. I heard a fifth step last week on Saturday. Uh, at my home group tomorrow, I'll meet with the man. He'll have his eight step list ready um, so I like to think I, I look at uh, all three sides of the triangle. So um, let's see if we can. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thing I like about, uh, you know, I often tease the guys at my home group, if you want to hide something from an alcoholic, I just put it in the big book. Uh, but the, the, the forward to the first edition, you know, we have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And to show, and that's an active word, other alcoholics precisely how we recovered is the main purpose of this book. And so I hope over the next little bit that we're visiting together, I'm going to tell you how I recovered from the disease of alcoholism and some of the uh, things that happened along the way. So I was born and raised in the city of London. Uh, so where's London? It's uh, right between Toronto and Detroit. So half our city uh, cheers for the Toronto Blue Jays, the other half for the Detroit Tigers, half for the Toronto Maple Leafs, half for the Red Wings. Uh, it's about 500,000 people. It's a university town. There's a college here, you know, some insurance companies. You know, it's pretty middle class, um, you know, I, w I grew up uh, in one of the suburbs. Uh, I've got a sister 23 months older than me. Uh, my mom was a registered nurse. My dad was a traveling sales rep. Um, you know, we got to participate in a lot of different things. You know, we got sent away to a, a camp about four hours north of our city, you know, for the month of August. Uh, you know, now that I, I have children, I understand why my parents did that. You know, it was their vacation. Um, you know, I, my sister and I participated in, in a number of sports. Uh, you know, my mom and dad took us across Canada, you know, in the proverbial station wagon with the tent trailer behind it and dad smoking a cigarette and wouldn't roll down the windows and got to see all of Canada. And it was, you know, I just remember it was a, it was a good childhood. Uh, but you know, you shake a family tree, they say, you know, an alcoholic falls out. You shake my family tree and a lot of people fall out. Um, and uh, there was this, um, it, I was a number of years sober before I found out my, my father told me he had lost his license in 1971 for a DUI. Um, you know, I remember a couple of times, you know, uh, my mom pouring liquor down the drain. Um, so, you know, there, there there were there were challenges in the house, but that doesn't make a, a bad childhood. Um, but a big change was in 1977. So I was 11 years old, um, and my my mom's mother, my nana, was a widow, and she lived in Niagara Falls, and she couldn't really care for herself anymore. So it was decided between my mom and her sister she'd come down to London and live with us, and we lived in a you know, a side split with lots of stairs. So we had to move from 
the subdivision we're in to another part of town. And, um, you know, I uprooted and, and, and the move was made. And, you know, the first day of school, it's funny how, you know, two, three minutes can really change someone's life. So I'm in a new school. I don't know anyone. And I got put in a class and about 10 minutes into the school day, the principal comes to the door, calls the teachers out, principal leaves, teacher says, Lance, you're in the wrong class. You got to go upstairs to Mr. Webster's room. I don't know where that is. And he goes, upstairs room 201. So I go up there and I'm, I'm timid and I don't know it really. I'm out of sorts and I knock on the door to Mr. Webster's room and he opens the door and goes, what do you want? And I said, do you want me? And some kid went, made a smart aleck comment. And one of my attributes is I have a very quick tongue. And I gave the kid an insult right back. The only problem is, is he was a cool kid. And I then suffered three years of unbelievable bullying until uh, grade nine. Um, I would have to fight my way home. Um, and a buddy of mine once said, your face is too pretty for a guy with a mouth like yours, Lance. And, uh, but I, I learned how to fight with both my fists and my mouth. But something happened uh, about three weeks into the school year. Uh, the community, the subdivision, I moved, had a travel hockey team and I'd made the hockey team. And I was walking home and I was set on by two guys and I was kind of holding my own. And another, I saw another person coming along and I thought it was going to be three on one. Well, no, it was two on two. And it was a guy from the hockey team. And sort of all of a sudden with the odds changing, the other two guys left me alone. And I said, thanks, man. And he goes, hey, we're teammates. We look out for each other. And I understood at that point that I could fit in if I excelled at sports. And I became driven in everything I did to be the best because it was the external validation that could make me feel okay inside. No drinking yet. 1980, I head off to grade nine. First Friday of the school year, there's a school dance. Me and two buddies, you know, I'm looking for a fresh start. We go get a 26 or a Bacardi rum. We go down by the railway tracks and we hit it hard. And here's the thing is, I was drinking more than them and I'd never had exposure to alcohol at that point in my life. And it was awesome. I, I went to the dance. I was not self-conscious. I think I had a good time because I blacked out. We went to McDonald's afterwards. I threw up in the parking lot. And the next day when I got together with my buddies, we kind of pieced the night together. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. From being nervous and I just, it just made me feel good. Um, but one of the things I found out was very early is I drank differently. And I don't mean alcoholically. I had a very large capacity. I could drink significant quantities of alcohol compared to my peers. And I, I took that as a badge of honor. Um, you know, in Canada at the time, it was grade 13. Um, so five years of high school, it's now grade 12. You know, I made the high school hockey team in grade 10. Um, you know, uh, running back on the football team. Um, you know, I, I actually played 11 different sports in high school. Um, it's just kind of the way it was. And in grade nine, there weren't a lot of opportunities to party, but when I got the opportunity, I did. And whenever I drank, it was not for any other reason than to get drunk. And um, what happened in grade 10 was uh, I was playing on a travel hockey team that had been assembled to kind of win everything. And it turned out we did. We won the provincial championship, all these tournaments. But at the beginning of the hockey season, the coach uh, had everyone over to his house and he gave us the talk, you know, about drinking and drugs. 
And he says, you know, we're, we're making a commitment, the coaches to you, we're asking the kids, you, not to party. And I kind of sort of bought in. Um, and what it was, was I was, when I went out, I did my best not to get drunk. Um, and as high school started to progress, drinking became more prominent. And I'm sure many of you can identify with that. Um, but what was interesting is, you know, if you go to page 30 in the big book, you know, it says the idea that somehow someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. Why was I trying to control my drinking? Because it was starting to affect my athletic performance. And so what I did is I doubled down on my training. Um, and, you know, alcohol is the great remover. So one of the guys I played hockey with has two Stanley Cup rings. A number played pro hockey in Europe. A number went away on hockey scholarships. I also made the high school golf team in grade 10. I, my family were excellent golfers. Um, and uh, the club my parents belonged to, the pro was talking about, you know, golf scholarships. And what happened was I started to hear, Lance, you have so much potential. But alcohol is the great remover. And what happened is my friends that I was playing sports with were able to focus and dedicate themselves. My drinking became more important. I don't know if I would ever have got those opportunities because my ability to perform sports at a high level diminished because of my drinking. Interestingly now, uh, my sponsor, um, uh, was a first round pick into the NHL. Um, and we coached together for a season, uh, a number of years ago and, uh, his career was cut short due to alcoholism. So we, we had a lot of chit chats about that. Um, and by the time I got to grade 12, I couldn't not party. And, uh, there's two tests in the big book, uh, page 31. One of them says, uh, step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Well, I can just tell you, I was going out to not get drunk, but it wasn't working. I wasn't ever thinking about not drinking. It was just, how can I get the formula right? But there's another test over on page 34. It says, if anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let them try leaving liquor alone for one year. My perception of what happened when I was a young man is different than I think it was. I felt I never fit in. I felt I was different. Yet in grade 13, I was elected to student council. And the position I was elected to, the number of votes I got, if you compared them to the other four people running, were double what all four of them got combined. But my perception was I wasn't enough. And we went off to this uh, student council retreat with all the high schools. And there was a motivational speaker. And he said to me, or he said to the group, you know, if you think you might have a problem with alcohol, why don't you give it up for a month? Well, on the, on the ride home, everyone was like, yeah, we're not going to drink for a month. And I got home and I told my mom and I said, hey, I'm not going to drink for a month. And she said, that's good. And uh, the next Saturday morning, I got up, hung over as all get out. I walked downstairs and my mom looks at me and she just simply said, I thought you said you weren't going to drink for a month. I made it six days. It had left my mind that I'd made that commitment not to drink. So I head off to university, the first Howard to ever go to university. My parents were really excited. And um, I took four years to do two years of a three-year degree, majored in alcoholism, minored in absenteeism. Um, you know, I think the highlight of my career was I was on the front page of the university newspaper wearing a toga, holding two beers, and the caption said, Lance Howard demonstrating the debilitating effects of alcohol on the motor neuron system. You know, and there you go, mom and dad. That, that's what that's what your son 
brings to the family. So I leave university without graduating. I get hired. You know, I'm 21, 22 years old. Uh, and I'm just going to say, you know, I'm not going to go through too much more of the drinking story. We, it's the same for everyone. But right at the end of my drinking, I'm working for this company. They've got an EAP program. I'm seeing a psychiatrist. Um, I've been in to see my family doctor because my dad had had some heart troubles. And my mom said, oh, you should go get checked out. She was really worried about my lifestyle. I learned after I got sober, my mom and dad had a bet that I wasn't going to make age 30. They were sure they were going to see a funeral. Um, but the family doctor had me start to control my drinking. And I don't know if anyone here has ever uh, been in that situation of late stage alcoholism where you're trying to control your drinking. Um, I had this big pumpkin head on me, bright red. I was about 60 pounds heavier than I am now. Uh, I had a girlfriend. We were living together. She was in the process of moving home. I was two and a half times my annual salary and credit card debt. Uh, the company I was working for was really hoping I was going to seek employment elsewhere. And um, <laughs> I just thought I was having a string of bad luck. And in April, the curling club my parents belonged to, I was in a curling bond spiel. Our first game was at nine in the morning. I've got a cup of coffee. I'd got up that morning. This was a not drinking day in my little chart. The doctor had made me. I'm not drinking. We get on the ice. The guy says, hey, Lance, would you like a little drambuie in your coffee? And I said, sure, that'd be great. And I was off on a tear. My dad took my car keys from me, gave me 20 bucks for a taxi. I knocked over it. Like, you know, it was a schmozzle. But it was a not drinking day. And that was baffling me. And it tells us on page 24. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice and drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We're without defense against the first drink. Why couldn't I say no to that drink? I know now why, but I was not going to drink. You know, think the drink through. It didn't happen. I had a blank spot. So anyway, at the end of the night, I order a taxi. The taxi comes, someone else gets in it. I tore a strip off the waitress. And I'm halfway going up one side of her and I'm just about to start it. My wife now, at the time, my girlfriend, and she's the kindest, gentlest woman. She looks at me and she says, Lance, we're walking home. Let's go. And as we walked home, she told me who and what I was and I couldn't defend myself. Losers Hall of Fame. Actually, what it was, was I was suffering from a chronic fatal disease called alcoholism, and I didn't know it. And that night, I got home, and I said the alcoholic prayer. And I'm sure there's people on this screen that have said the prayer. I said from the bottom of my soul, God help me. And I meant it. I was done. The next day we got up and we went to church because that's another thing I've been trying to do to be able to control and enjoy my drinking. And in uh, my wife's Catholic, I'm not. And we were in St. Peter's Basilica and I had a bright light spiritual experience. My English language isn't sufficient to describe it. But I knew then, one, if I kept drinking, I was going to die. And two, I didn't have to drink ever again. And somehow the next day, I show up in an AA meeting. And I called the, the Monday morning, I called the AA hotline. And I have no, I have no, I read, I don't know why I called it. No one in my family had ever gone to AA. And if there's anyone on the screen that's involved with their local, uh, you know, phoning, thank you. Because the guy got me on the phone and, you know, he got me to my first meeting and I was, you know, I called at about nine in the morning. He said, there's a meeting at 10. That was a little quick for me. And, you know, I was a scared guy. And I, I said, well, I'm a businessman. I can't leave the office during the day. 
And he said, oh, there's a great meeting tonight. It's called BNPM, Business and Professional Men's Group. Lawyers, doctors, dentists, you know, those sorts of people go there. I went to that meeting for years. They're just people like me and you, you know. But I went to that first meeting and um, I don't remember much. But it's exactly what I thought an AA meeting should look like. Because back in 92, when I got sober, you could still smoke in meetings. I walk in and there's this haze of blue smoke. You know, there's a coffee pot in the back and all these guys milling around, all these old guys. I was 25 when I came in. And um, went in, the meeting split. Non-smokers downstairs, like that made any difference. And, and smokers stayed up. So down to the basement. And they says, oh, maybe we should talk about the first step. Uh, you know, I wonder how they knew, eh? And um, so, uh, but like in 92 in London, the big book wasn't a big focus of AA meetings. Um, and so, you know, they kind of told their war stories, everyone around and told what it was like. But I heard a few things and I met a few guys and they said, hey, there's this meeting on Thursday night, Riverside Men's Group. And I went to it and, and that became my home group. Uh, but what's interesting is well, I walked in and I told them, I said, I'm done drinking for the rest of my life. And they, they guys darn near swallowed their tongues. You know, they're like, oh, no, no, we, we don't drink a day at a time. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. I'm done. I'm going to die from this thing. Um, and, and you know what's interesting, you know, throughout the big book, you know, it, it continually tells us that. You know, it, you know, on page 90, it says if he wants to stop over on page 116. You know, one of the things it says is uh, it may convince your husband he wants to stop drinking forever. And at my home group, you know, one of the things they they said, um, not at that meeting, but shortly thereafter, is you need never drink again. And that's something I like to tell newcomers when they come in. You know, if you are at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you need never drink again if you're a real alcoholic. Um, so... Um, there wasn't an urgency on the steps. It was don't drink, go to meetings. Um, and I got active in the fellowship. Uh, one or two months in, I got a sponsor. Um, the first guy I asked to be my sponsor, I asked him simply because he was a doctor and I thought he was important because he was a doctor. And he said, no. Um, then there was this guy, Don Power, great guy. Been gone a number of years now, great guy. And I went up to Don and I said, Don, you know, I don't know what the sponsor thing is, but everyone says I need to get one. And he laughed at me and he says, nah, I'm not going to be your sponsor, Lance. But I think if you go talk to Al, he'll be your sponsor. And I think as Al said, he drew the short straw. He got me. So I went and I asked Al and Al became my sponsor. And um, <laughs> it... Um, you know, just go to lots of meetings. We fellowship great. We play squash on, on Saturday morning. And uh, at six months, my city has a conference every year. And the keynote speaker on the Saturday night was a guy by the name of Clancy I. And uh, we got all dressed up, shirt and tie, and it was a gala dinner. And I, I've got it written down here because it, 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 what he said was so profound to me, but you can get tongue tied sometimes. It says, Clancy said, if you're an alcoholic, your problem is not and cannot be alcohol. And conversely, if your problem is alcohol, you're not an alcoholic. And that ripped a bandaid off my untreated alcoholism. See, there's two ways to treat the disease of alcoholism. One is with alcohol, the others is with the 12 steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But here's the thing. I'd stopped drinking six months ago, but I hadn't started doing the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm in untreated alcoholism. The only difference is, is I'm just not physically drunk every day. And one of the things that had happened and why I love this big book so much is I had got a copy of the big book. And you know how I told you everyone was telling me to control my drinking? Nobody ever told me I couldn't drink because of the allergy. And when I read the doctor's opinion and he explained, it was like, are you kidding me? This is what, see, I didn't know the problem. 
I didn't know, but there's this light switch on the back of my neck that when I have that first drink, it gets flicked. And it's like, let's get her on, like, let's go. And I just drink and I drink and I drink. And my wife would say to me, I'd come home from the bars and I'd go to the fridge and there'd be a half bottle of wine and I'd pour myself a glass of wine. And she goes, why do you do that? I'm like, I don't know. But I, if there's booze around, I drink it if I've started drinking. And when I read that in the big book, things started to make sense. So around this time, my sponsor took me out for a cough and he says, Lance, I'd, I'd like you to stop telling people that I sponsor you. <laughs> I was like, why? He goes, because I don't know what you're saying in meetings, but man, the, the feedback I'm getting, and it, like I was just stark, I was stark raving sober. My nickname at my home group was Furious George. Like I was just a seething, angry young man. And then my sponsor said, well, I guess we better get into the steps. I know better today. I, I would never wait six months to get someone into the steps. But I got into the steps and I was very fortunate. I did them out of the big book. And again, in I guess this would be 93 now or maybe the end of 92, um, the sponsors didn't hear for steps in London. You went to a man of the cloth. So I went to this guy to do my fifth, Reverend Tony, who was a, a member of the club. And, you know, I'd done it. And, and I, I, as I, I did the fourth column and I did the fear inventory and the sex and, and I could just see, you know, as it says in the big book, fear weaved itself throughout my life, just completely dominated my life. And I'm, I'm sitting there with Tony and, uh, I, how do I get rid of the fear? And he goes, well, how'd you quit drinking, Lance? I said, I went to AA. He goes, no, you didn't. I said, I did, Tony. He goes, no, you didn't. How'd you quit drinking, Lance? And as I thought about it, and I had a last drunk, God help me. He goes, that's right. If you want to get rid of fear in your life, okay, you need to put God in your life. And I think it says it so beautifully on page 68 in the big book. And it says, perhaps there is a better way. We think so. We are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. So I did, you know, I did six and seven, then I made my list. And, you know, one of the things I... I had a habit of liberating things from people without their consent, you know, as a thief. Um, and so I had a lot of amends. I wrote a lot of checks. Um, and, you know, I was able to make amends with my parents. Uh, my father and I had a very poor relationship. Poor is not even the right word, horrible. And it slowly changed. Why? Because I would talk to my sponsor, I'd pray on things, and I was willing to set things right. And I was able to sit my father down and have a talk with him and sit, sit down with my mom. But I think, you know, as a mama's boy, I don't think I could ever do any wrong in my mom's eyes. Uh, but that's a whole other story. And sufficient to say we lost my dad a couple of years ago to dementia. Um, but, uh, you know, right at the end, you know, I remember one time he went in to see him and he just looked at me and he said some of the most kindest, loving things about me, but he wasn't there. And I knew it was coming from his, the very bottom of his soul. My dad and I were right together. And that's simply due to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, um, and then good stuff started to happen. You know, we were talking before the meeting, you know, I got sober in 92 and 95. I went to the, the World AA conference, you know, the company that was going to fire me. You know, two years later, I walk across the stage at a sales conference, you know, top 10 in sales out of 1,200 sales rep across Canada. Um, you know, in 1994, let's see, I got married. I got a minivan. I got a dog, bought a house, had a child, started my own business. You know, it was just, but one of the things was, I was confusing doing better with being better. See, 
I went through the steps, but there was no emphasis on 10, 11, and 12. Whose fault's that? That's mine. Could be my home groups too, but at the end of the day, you don't let anyone else read your big book for you, right? It's my responsibility. Um, but then Joe and Charlie came to town and I wasn't able to go to it, but one of the guys got the, um, the Joe and Charlie tapes and he gave me a set and, you know, and that, that propelled me. And you know what, sort of from year three to year 15, I'd say life was pretty good. I was doing a few things right, but I wasn't doing everything. I wasn't thorough in my program. So I'd been taught, hit your knees every morning, and I did. But I wasn't taught to do the disciplines of the 11th step at night or in the morning. Whose fault's that? That's mine. But maybe it was my home group as well. But at the end of the day, I'm responsible for my program. And, you know, just before that, at about two years, Al fired me as a as my sponsor. And it was the most loving thing he could do because I wasn't listening to him anymore. He was talking to a brick wall. And as I look back now, slowly my ego was rebuilding because I was having the success externally. I got another sponsor, a very charismatic man, a Scottish fellow, really knew the big book. But let's get to year 15. I've got three children. I've got a business. I'm on the board of a couple charities. Life's happening. And if you read page 60, 61, it talks about how we manipulate people, how we can be kind, you know, all these different things. But the ego, and if only people would do as I pleased, okay? Then my mom died. From the time she was diagnosed with cancer until she got called home, it was 16 days. You know, and as I left the hospital, first thing I did, called a guy in the program. But then the next year, my sponsor died sober. I didn't get another sponsor. You know, I was going to my home group, but I threw myself into coaching, coaching hockey. Other things, I threw myself into business. I did a few things right. I hit my knees every morning, but it was kind of a hollow prayer. I never missed my home group. I wasn't, I wasn't sponsoring anyone. I wasn't active. God flicked me on the ear in a meeting. I was sitting in a meeting parroting. Don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor. And this thought comes into my head. Oh my God, you're a hypocrite. You don't have a sponsor. And so I went and got myself a sponsor. The other thing I did is I pulled my third edition down off the shelf. The fourth had been out for many years. I blew the dust off it. Um, And, you know, I just kept going along. You know, I'm 20 years sober. 22 years sober, things don't feel right. Not thinking about drinking, but you know, I'm, I'm angry with my wife. I'm yelling at the kids. I, my ego has built up, you know, I'm not a kind and loving person. Um, my wife and I were trying to figure out our relationship and she was pursuing her own spiritual path. And one day she says to me, would you mind having a cup of coffee with my spiritual advisor? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And so I go to see this lady and, you know, we're also talking about marriage counseling and I'm thinking there might be a divorce on the horizon, eh? And I'm just thinking, what am I doing wrong here? You hear what I'm saying? What am I doing wrong? See, what I'd done is I said, God, hold my beer. And I took control of everything else. I got my marriage. I got my business. I got my kids. I got my coaching. I have this. I'll figure it out. I'll brute force my way through this. 
And so I go and I meet with this and have a cup of tea with her. And uh, I tell her, you know, I pray and I've been trying to meditate, but it was more Eastern meditation because that's what my wife's doing. She goes, why do you pray? And I said, well, you know, I'm 24 years sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. She goes, oh, 24 years sober, eh? How many men do you sponsor? And I got real uncomfortable. And I said, none. And she looked at me with soft eyes that were hard. She said, I thought it was a 12-step program, not an 11-step program. And that just hit me right in the solar plexus. I went home that night and I hit my knees. It was probably right after I got home. And I prayed like I've never prayed before. And I threw myself into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know how to. But you know what? Sober cast, XA speakers, Mad Dog Recovery, these were starting to be out. I started doing workshops. I went through the steps again. And then I went through the steps again. And I made amends to my children. My children had never seen me drink. Yet here I am making amends to them. And there was a lot. And give you an example, my eldest daughter, oh my God, I'm so proud of her. You know, she did a double masters at U of T. She's a curator of a museum now at 29 years of age. But you know, a number of years ago when I was doing it, you know, I go through and I said, you know, this is how I believe I've harmed you. Is there anything I'm not aware of that you'd like to share with me? And she goes, you know, dad, you're good at business. That's not my thing. I really love what I'm doing. You tease me about what I'm doing. I wish you wouldn't do that. Done. I have never teased her again. That's how you make it right. But I didn't know that because I was too self-absorbed. And I'm so proud of her and we just have a wonderful relationship today. See, but what happened now is 10, 11, and 12. Because because I've done a lot of coaching, the guy at my home group represented Canada in the Olympics. My sponsor played in, you know, the NHL. I know a lot of high-performing athletes. We talk about practice. And one of the things you hear is practice makes perfect. It doesn't. Practice makes permanent. If you practice the wrong things, you have wrong habits. If you practice the right things, you have right habits. Guess what? Elite sports, we're in the NHL playoffs here in Canada, it consumes us. Whether it's basketball, football, hockey, championships are won in a fatigued state. And when you have a tired body, you have a tired mind. And when you have a tired mind, you can make mistakes or you resort, resort to habits. That is why the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 are so important because we are practicing good habits every day because it talks about not if, when problems crop up. And it's when we're tired, do we resort to our old habits or do we resort to a new way of living that we've been given? Okay. And that's, see, when we're fatigued physically, mentally, or spiritually, okay, we've got to have something. And that's why every day, like here, just like here, here's my little book. Like just every night, every day, I'm doing what it tells me exactly on page 86. And I am a badger with the men I sponsor now. It's a non-negotiable. I'm regularly saying, I want to see what you're writing. What are you doing? And why am I that way? Because I almost blew up my marriage. I almost estranged my kids, stone cold sober. Because what I had was untreated alcoholism and I didn't know it because it had crept up on me slowly. And now that I'm back in the program for a number of years and doing what needs to do, I can see what sobriety 
don't drink and go to meetings. In sobriety, do the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and be disciplined in 10 and 11 and 12 so you can grow spiritually. I don't regret not doing it because life was okay then. Life is awesome now. I have all sorts of problems now, but I have a toolkit now that I can use. And see, one of the challenges I had, I always felt inadequate. And I thought the opposite of inadequate was perfection. Perfection. It's not. It's adequate. I just have to be adequate today. And I used my perfectionism to hide from doing things that God gave me abilities to do. It was an excuse. I'm not scared of making mistakes today. So, you know, when it says you turn your will and your life over to the care of God in step three, okay, you know, he's gonna be our director. So a director needs to give you directions. Well, guess what? Steps 10, 11, and 12 are where you get your directions from God. And since we only have a day, that's why you need to do them daily. Okay. So why do I get so passionate about these? Two and a half years ago, I'm sitting right here in this, right here. It's a Saturday night. My wife's away at a yoga conference. Both my daughters moved back home during COVID. I hear some dram upstairs and I don't know if any, there's fathers of daughters here. So sometimes I just do the typical father thing, become a coward and just hide while they're having their drama, right? But that little voice inside said, call her down. Grab my phone, text her. I said, hey, why don't you come down and talk to the old man? About 11.30 at night. I'm normally in bed early. I don't know why I was up but I do know why I was up. She comes down, she comes through that door right there. She sits down right beside me, reeking of liquor. She said, dad, I got a problem with alcohol. I think I'm an alcoholic. I said, I know you are. I've known for a long time. She was in this book a lot. I talked with my sponsor a lot, but you know what? Because I was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous who was sponsoring many, many men. I don't know how I did it, but I was able to pick up this book and 12 step my daughter. Next day I got her to a meeting and I turned her over to some very strong women in Alcoholics Anonymous. My daughter is two and a half years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. She's got one, one desire chip. She sponsors girls. She is a force to be reckoned with. And when we talk about, we see lives transformed, I wanna tell you something, kind of get a little choked up here. It's great to see lives transformed, but it's really great to see a family member's life transformed. And the only reason that happened was because I turned my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood them. And at 24 years sober, somebody who was a friend of the program called me out for going through the motions. And I recommitted to the program. And, you know, my wife and I, this uh, July 9th, we'll celebrate 30 years of marriage. We're heading over to Italy to celebrate our 30th anniversary. You know what? At 26 years sober, I did a sex inventory. It had nothing to do with the hokey pokey, right? It was like, what is the ideal relationship I want with my wife? And then I had to, I had to go to God. I had to go to God to find the courage so I could have those conversations with her. The tools are there for us. The tools are there for us. So what do my disciplines look like now? I've got just a few minutes left because here's one of the things is it's, it's, it's not, my, my first sponsor used to say to me, you know, it's give us this day our daily bread, not last month's bread, you know? So what do I do today to stay in the game? You know, when I wake up in the morning, my eyes open up and I talk to God right away, even before I roll out of bed to say my prayers. 
I roll out of bed and I, I, I've, I've got some prayers. I'm not going to tell them because you know what? We all have our own. But I hit my knees and I speak my prayers out loud. Then I go to the bathroom and I do what I got to do. I get a cup of coffee. I go out on the grass. I ground myself. I try to get some sunlight in my eyes. I come in. I sit at, at, at this table here. I've got three or four spiritual books I read. I do some breathing exercises. But then I think about my day ahead. And on page 83, asking each morning in meditation that our creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. So I think about my day ahead. I'll give you an example of yesterday. So my daughter that's now two and a half years sober, she's buying her first house. It closes June 3rd. We had to go to the lawyers yesterday. So yesterday morning, in high stress situations, I tend to make smart ass comments. My daughter gets really uncomfortable and I knew it was gonna be a high stress. So I was able in the morning in my meditation, I was thinking about my day. I'm not planning the outcome. I'm not planning the outcome. But I said, we're gonna be at the lawyer's office. Okay, think about your daughter. Think about her stress level. How can you be of service to your daughter while you're there? That's how I apply the steps in my day. That's how I apply the disciplines in my day. Then I go, well, now I'm really fortunate. My business partner's 35 years sober. So it's really easy for me to walk down the hall and say, hey, I got a quick 10 step talk with you. 45 seconds later, boom, we're done. But at night, out comes the pen. I constructively review my day. Okay? But this, here's something I missed for the first 25 years of my sobriety. I'm not going to say I'm the sharpest attack in the box. You know, as I used to jokingly say, you know, three years in grade three, all it got me was tallest kid in the class once, you know. But it says here, you know, were we kind and loving towards all? What could we have done better? Were we thinking of ourselves um, or, or what we could do for others of what we could pack into the stream of life? You know, we've got to be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. My second sponsor used to say to me, you know, be careful about gazing at your belly button, Lance. It can turn into a black hole and consume you. You know, like, yes, you want to reflect on your day, but, you know, let's not take it too far. But here, this is what I missed. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. That's really steps six and seven, isn't it? And so now, and you know what? Some days I just have a good day. There's, there's, there's nothing on the evening review. <laughs> That's just it. But there's other days when it's like, hmm. And now where the real growth for me has become is, okay, what should I have done instead, God? And then I sit and I wait to see what comes into my mind. And then I write it down. And a friend of mine, Steve Barry, a couple of years ago, turned me on to two-way prayer. And that has been really significant um, in, in my life. Um, you know, the twowayprayer.org, um, you know, online workshops. And it's uh, there's a number of guys that I, I'm in contact regularly that do it. And the transformation in people's lives are just amazing. And then, you know, just active in 12 step. I see I got a couple of minutes left by the little hand on the clock. You know, I just page 159, I believe it is. Let me get there. Yeah. Okay. They knew that they must help other alcoholics if they would remain sober. That motive became secondary. It was transcended by the happiness they found in giving themselves for others. During COVID, my wife and I talked, I've got a little man shed on the back of my property. It's not really a man shed. It's, you know, three leather chairs, flat screen TV, wood burning stove. But um, I knew people were going to die of active alcoholism quicker than they were going to die of, you know, the flu. So I said to my wife, you know, is it okay if I have men over to hear fifth steps? And I kind of became known as the guy that would hear fifth steps. 
And so over COVID, I heard about 55th steps. Um, and uh, it's unbelievable. Every time I hear a fifth step, it's a privilege, but I hear, I learn more about myself, but nothing gets me more jazzed, like nothing. And getting down on my knees with another man and saying the third step prayer. The happiness and the joy I get from that is unbelievable. And that's what they're talking about. And so I'm going to say, you know, if you're new, welcome. You need never drink again. But if you're not so new, and maybe you haven't been as sharp on your disciplines, or maybe you haven't been doing 12-step work, I missed a lot of joy and happiness not doing it. I don't miss it today. I'd ask you consider maybe re-engaging. I appreciate you for letting me come and spend an hour with you and tell you a little bit of my story. Thanks so much. Recording stopped. Wow, Lance, <clears throat> what a journey through your recovery. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Eric's going to put up a, a vision for you. Does someone, would someone please read that? Uh, anybody want to jump in there? I'll read it. Hi, Thanks, everybody. My name is Sally, and I'm an alcoholic. Sally. It's suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose to you and to us. Ask him in the morning meditation, in your morning meditation, what you can do each day for the man who's still sick. The answers will come. If your own house is in order, but obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to you pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the, happy, the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. <clears throat> Thank you, Sally. And we will call the Lord's Prayer. You can unmute if you want. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance. Man, yes, that... Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As you thank talk... you, Lance. It was awesome. Thank you. As you talked about uh, Zoom and podcasts i got sober in 79 i got all the clancy t cassettes and everybody's cassettes and i i've like a thousand cassettes in, in this house made duplications and all and i also talked talk to you about the montreal convention where uh, i had these four t tape teasers uh cassettes on charlie and joe and i have had them come over to um, people come over to my house and listen to them we weren't even touching the uh, discussions that they were having in our big book meetings. And at the end of the, uh, the Montreal convention, the guy nudged me and said, Hey, that's, that's Joe speaking. And I, I, my God, it was Joe. And he was, he was a, a, a hero of mine of, of sort. And I went over to this, uh, uh, trustee of, uh, Jimmy, uh, Schofield and, uh, and, uh, told him, I just saw uh, Joe, Charlie and Joe, and he goes, oh, we booked him for uh, coming to New York in 1988. Would you like to be on the convention committee? I was the committee. And we had, we had, we organized it all. We had about 600 people there, and it was so wild, wonderful people. And I'd been, That'd be awesome. So. Well, I sure appreciate your talk, Lance. It may, give me a lot of uh, food for thought and things I need to do. I really 
We are undisciplined people. <laughs> hey, here's my discipline. I like this. Uh oh. See this? That's my eleven step notebook. It's almost full now. I'm about about ready to get another one. Oh good. Started this one in January. I love this. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So. I do too now. Yeah. So thank you for touching on that and, and driving it home. I like it. So Je you. Jeannie, you're talking about a business meeting the other uh, before the meeting, and I have this. Uh, sorry, I got the blur thing going on here. During how this says. Uh, if I were in the zoo, what does it say? AA business meeting manual. <laughs> <laughs> I love. Oh, I love that. So. Woo! And. It was a zoo last night. I thought I was in a nut ward for a minute. <laughs> so. Horrible. But yeah. anyway, but anyway, Lance, good job. Great, yeah. journey, great journey through your story, and I loved it. It was uh, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for those kind words. Okay, I'm gonna log off. All right. Thanks for doing it. Good luck with the house tomorrow. Thank you. You uh, take.